It is uh, wonderful to be here. And, uh, you know, I've got to tell you again, Merry Christmas. <clears throat> you might think, well, Christmas was yesterday. I thought we're done with that. No, we are not. Do you know why? Anybody? Any guesses? Any guesses? This is day two, the turtle doves, the 12 days of Christmas. It rocked my world when I found this out. I used to think that Christmas started, you know, 12 days before, and on the 12th day, that was ba-boom. You know, Christmas has arrived, we're done. But no, the 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas Day with the partridge in the pear tree, and then the turtle doves, and then what comes next? The three golden hens, is that right? And the four, what are they? The French hens, I was just seeing if you knew it, right? And then you, you go the rest of the way through the song. <clears throat> Did that shift your thinking just a little? Have, have you known that for most of your life? There's this new thing uh, on social media where you go, I was this many days old, years old, when I found this out. Today, for some of you, today is an earth-shattering day. You have found out the 12 days starts on Christmas, and your world will never be the same. When you sing that song, when you think about that song, when you think about Christmas, you're going to think, the 12 days of Christmas, we can keep celebrating. <clears throat> and you should. You should keep your tree up at least until January 5th or 6th. And if you want to be nice to the Orthodox folks and the, and the other, you know, side of Christianity, because there's like, you know, the Western world, and then there's the Eastern world. The Eastern Orthodox celebrate Christmas on January 7th or 8th, the 6th, January 6th. Yeah, and so they start the 12 days of Christmas on January 6th. Now, if you want to be really nice to them, you keep it up for 12 more days. Now, there are some people who never take down their Christmas tree, literally and truly, they keep it up year-round. If it's alive, that's fine, but if it's, if it's dead... I mean, if it's a tree that was alive and is now dead, you should take it down for fire reasons. But moving on. Today we're talking about coffee cup Christianity, new year, new you. Um, and the question is, well, really? Uh, there's all these sayings you find on coffee cups, and, and they're, you know, trying to do well, mean well, be well, and all that kind of stuff. But they, they're just kind of sometimes off-putting. Because when you understand the context of, of the verse, you think, that doesn't really work. Um, that's not appropriate. Maybe, maybe not put that on a coffee cup, right? Maybe. Anyways, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. But the, the big idea here, though, also is this. It is the end of the year, but it's also my first sermon before the new year, so I'm going to encourage you to think about the new year, right? But at the same, what about this year? This year has been so wonderful, hasn't it? 2021, the year that we want to repeat again and again. <laughs> Not. <laughs> In fact, go back a few years to 2020, right? And, and that's a year we don't want to have happen again. And I don't know about you, but I've kind of forgotten about 2020 and 2021 as much as possible as it happened. I just wanted to just go, no, didn't happen. Not believing it. No, not, not good. Um, but the whole idea of the new year is to set new ideas, new intentions. It's kind of like if you're doing that yoga thing or the stretching, if you don't want to call it yoga because that's somehow evil. Um, you, you know, just proper stretching. You want to set an intention for your workout. And you say, what am I going to focus on today as I, as I do all these meditations and sit and, and stretch and all this? And you think, oh, this is a good one. I should do this. I should think about love, think about joy, think about peace. And yes, that will be my focus, right? Well, at the new year, that's what you want to do as well, kind of set a new flavor. But you also have to think about the past year and what happened and how are you going to live as a result of all that mess, right? So when you think about all of that, you also start to think about the end of your life. And you start to say, who do I want to be known as? Like, you know, that when somebody stands up here and there's... Let's be honest. Nobody has a coffin in church anymore. It used to be that you're, you, you know your sitting room in your house. That's... That's where you were laid out historically. It was in your own home that your funeral would be held. That's strange. Kind of sick and twisted, right? And, and yet, in church, we don't even lay out a body anymore. If we have the ashes, that's amazing. Typically, it's just a memorial service, and it's not even that. What do we call it these days? Do you remember? Celebration of life, because we don't want to be negative, y'all. <laughs> Got to be positive. Everything's happy, happy, joy, joy. Don't want you to be sad too long, but... When you think about that celebration of life, what do we do? 
We want to speak well of the dead, of the departed. We want to say so many nice, wonderful things, everything that we can that's possible, and, and we struggle to, to... I mean, if they're a good person, it's easy. You can come up with a thousand things to say about them, but if they're not that good, if they've kind of been obnoxious, kind of a jerk, it's really hard to say anything good about them. I mean, you might think of an incident or a time or this or that, <sighs> but what if it's you? <laughs> I mean, you're the one that we're memorializing, celebrating, enjoying. This is the life of you. What do you want people to say? How do you want people to think of you? And that's how we want to encourage people to think of their, their life when they die. <laughs> but really, we want them to think of their life so that when they die, they're remembered, remembered well, right? But the other side of that is that, that when you think about your own life, you want to have good memories, right? You want to live well. You want to live in such a way that people want to celebrate your life. And so a part of this is, you, from the scripture readings this morning, you know that we're talking about how to read your Bible as well. So, and I think it's incredi incredibly important how you read your Bible in order to determine how you live your life. So we'll deal with that uh, in just a bit. And so love has been our theme for this whole year. And next year... We're going to talk about prayer a lot. Prayer is going to be the theme for next year. So this is the last time you'll see this slide. If you need, take a picture, mourn, weep, wail, whatever it is appropriate for you. But you can always go on Facebook. Hi, Facebook friends. You can always go on there. The videos are there. The YouTube, it's there. If, if we caught to record it, it's still up, and you can still see them. So uh, let's pray as we begin. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you that you have called us here today as this people gathered in your presence. God, we do ask that you would open our hearts to you and to one another, that we'd hear your word, be excited about what you have to say, and that we would think anew, afresh, ideas that you have given us. God, may we all hear, including me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, to begin this, let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the chapter of love, but the verse that throws everybody off, because this is a fun one. This is the King James Version. It says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also, as also I am known. Okay, that, that's King James. It's not too bad, but what's this glass about? What are they talking about glass? Well, here's the amplified version, because it's so wonderful. It just made that so big. For now, we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or enigma. But then, when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Now, I know in part, imperfectly that is, but then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. That is a powerful understanding, isn't it? Now that changes things quite a bit. And here's the other. They didn't have glass mirrors back in the day. They had shined up polished metal. And depending on how much money you had and how much polish you did, depend on how good your mirror was. Now granted, they could probably make them pretty good, but they couldn't make them as good as we can today. I mean, today, people can make mirrors that are just stunning. But even then, they're not in three dimensions. I mean, in fact, you're looking at yourself in the reverse. And some people want to see themselves as everybody else sees them. Do you know what they do? They create a mirror that is um, a perfect 90-degree corner. And then they look at it, and the images are reflecting off of the other direction, so they see themselves as everybody else sees them. But even then, it's not in three dimension, but, but the flipping of their face sometimes freaks people out so much, they're just done. They're like, the world is shook. Like, how do people see me? They see me like that. That's awful. I can't handle that. And they get weird. Isn't that kind of strange? But, but it's true. Now, the other is that this, this idea of seeing clearly and understanding fully, that is powerful, isn't it? If you can really see a thing, if you really know something, then life... It has, it has better meaning, doesn't it? It's, it's more clear. It's more, ah, oh, everything. One of the issues of getting old that I don't like at all, I need a lot more light. If I want to look at something 
historically, it could be like almost dark, and I'd be like, oh, I can still read this, no problem. Now, it's like, can I get some sunlight over here? It's still not bright enough. Let's go outdoors. The sun better be shining, <laughs> right? And then maybe I can see the thing. And the other trick is you pull out your phone and you turn on the camera and then you turn on the flashlight so that the, the flash is showing and then you zoom in. <laughs> and then you can really read a thing. Whereas historically, you know, I could pull out a dollar bill and I could read the micro print. The print for security reasons, you're not supposed to be able to read or know it's there. I could read the tiny print going around the faces and so on. And now I'm like, uh, I think it's a 10, <laughs> right? This is obnoxious. But, but God says, the older you get, the better you should see, right? Not, not physically, but spiritually. The more life experience you have, if you've lived it well and paid attention, the clearer things should get. And in the end of time, not before, you're going to meet God face to face. And you'll see yourself as God sees you. And that will be better than 3D. That will be better than that perfect cornered mirror thing. You're going to know yourself like you've never known yourself. And you're going to know God like you've never known God. Won't that be amazing? That's what this verse is about. It's saying that when you love for a lifetime and God knows you and you know God, you still don't know him and you don't even know you. But when you die and you're with him in eternity, now, now you will know. That's amazing, right? So how's the water? And the other fish says, well, what's water? <laughs> Have you seen this before? Have you heard this before? This is one of these... Um, paradigm shifting things. It's one of these, hey, did you understand the 12 days of Christmas? Or, hey, um, how about this? Do you know your body actually hears your heart beating? But your body, because it hears it so frequently, tunes it out. Do you know when you get a heart, your heart fixed or you get a heart transplant, people initially hear that heartbeat for at least a week, maybe two, and it's just like never ending. Some of them can't sleep. Some of them can't eat. I mean, they are freaked out because they're like, I can hear my heart beating. This is so awful. I don't know what's going on. And then the doctor says, this is normal. Your system tunes it out because you don't need to hear it usually. But since everything's changed, it has to get new, used to the new one. Well, that's a paradigm shift, isn't it? That's a, that's a change in the way I see the world. I never knew that. Well, that's amazing. How about this? When you think of freedom as a child and you think of freedom as an adult, as a child, you think, when I'm an adult, I'll do whatever I want. And as an adult, you go, I wish I was a kid again, man. I don't have any freedom. <laughs> right? Then, I mean, think about Christmas. As a kid, you're like, it's Christmas. Yay, vacation. Don't have to do anything. And as an adult, you're going, it's Christmas. Vacation. I got to do all this stuff. Right? There's a huge world that changes in that moment. Now, this view of your world, for some of us, is upsetting. For some of us, when we really see things the way they're meant to be, it, it messes us up. And it causes us to go, this isn't how I wanted this to be. This isn't how I expected this. I don't, I don't want this at all. If this is the way it is, I'm just going to go back and put my, hole in the ground, my head in a hole in the ground, and I'm going to act like that didn't happen. I'm going to deny the existence of reality. And when we do that, we're setting ourselves up for pain and failure and just punishment, really. I mean, because the whole world's going to keep beating it into us, all these things we don't want to know and don't want to believe and don't want to understand. So the issue is, how do you read your Bible? And, and as we talk about this, my hope would be that you see this as refreshing <laughs> and life-giving and in a way of growing into a better way of thinking about God and the world around us. So, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, if we look at that, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. But hold on. Who's this written to? The name of the book is Timothy. It was written to Timothy. Who wrote it? Paul. Why did Paul write it? He was having some difficulties. Timothy, he was having difficulties, right? And hold on. It's 2 Timothy. This is the second time he wrote him at least, right? 
And he said, I see you've got some problems, so let me come and fix them. I'm going to give you some heads up on how to think about life and stuff. And here he says, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I've got problems with that, though. I have to tell you, I've got some problems. When I was growing up, and this verse was used, uh, didn't sit right with me because it was always used in a very negative way very painful. I didn't enjoy it at all. But, so let's see here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, right? Let's just go one verse above that, or a few. Let's just start in verse 10. If we start in verse 10, if you have your Bible and you want to open it, that's great. If you don't, just listen. It's okay to listen. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life. This is Paul saying, hey, I've done this stuff for a while, and you've seen it. You know my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. That's a long list of stuff, isn't it? Ha, huh. Paul, come on, man. Um, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured? He's like, oh, I put up with a lot of mess. You know this. You've seen it. Huh. Huh. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Wow. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Ooh. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's strange. Timothy's not that old. And we're still like in the year, I don't know, 50, 60, roughly. So we're only 30 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, right? And, and he's talking about scriptures which will make you wise to salvation and that all scripture is God-breathed. And I'm going, what scripture is that? I was told it's a New Testament and only the New Testament and there's nothing else. And I was like, oh, hold on. This is talking about the Old Testament. Oh. <gasps> This is saying, Paul is saying, you can go back into the Hebrew Bible, the scriptures of the Hebrew, what they sometimes call the Tanakh, and you can find Jesus. And when you find Jesus, it will give you life. It will bring you life. Oh, well, I like that. I want to live. I want to have a healthy, great life, right? Don't you? Isn't that a wonderful thing? And so, but here's the other. The way that this was used for me was, that the, the Bible is now a rule book that it will tell you how to live. And I mean by that, it will tell you exactly how to live. And I went, ah, yeah, that's a little painful. Now, the next verse that's often brought out when we're talking about these things is Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, do we know who wrote Hebrews? No, no, we don't. We think maybe it was Paul, but then the, the scholarly people say it probably wasn't Paul because guess what? The whole verbiage, everything he writes in there doesn't sound like Paul in Romans or any of the other letters, and he wrote a ton of letters. You know, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the whole way through, to basically to Hebrews, except not Hebrews probably. <laughs> so, does it matter who wrote it? Well, kind of, but not really, but he wrote it, whoever wrote it, he, some people even say it might have been a woman. <gasps> no, but you know what? Whoever wrote it, whoever wrote Hebrews, it's a beautiful book. And it's important, and it's life-giving, and it's powerful. And these verses are challenging. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. There was awe. Oh, there was a... A sermon, oh, I think his name's John Edwards. This dude, he talked about sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he would just put it out there, and he would just, the whole church was laid down. I mean, they were beat up and broken. And it was back in, you know, long, long ago when preaching like that was expected. And good preaching was just convicting, and you're a sinner, and repent. And they all did. <laughs> And he, what he did, though, is he focuses on how we're just so evil and God can't love us. And I don't think the Bible really does that. I mean, there's a part of it, yes. 
But what about the other side where God says, I love you so much, I sent my son. Like, that's huge, isn't it? And so there has to be some sense of balance in all this, right? And I mean, here, God's scripture can just tear you to pieces, and it can also bring you back to life. It, it does amazing stuff. And, and there's nothing you can hide from God. Now, in one sense, it's really scary, right? Because I think back to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, what did they do? As soon as their eyes were open, they went, ah! And they ran and hid, and they said, hey, we're naked. This ain't good. Let's put some fig leaves on. And that was itchy. And then God said, no, here's some, some leather. You can, you know, cover up with some, probably some sheep, lambs, wool, leather-like stuff. I mean, it's just really soft, and it's going to last a lot longer. It's not going to fall apart when it rains, you know. I mean, good stuff. And so God said, I care for you even when you disobey. I love you. Even as you struggle to understand it, I love you. And so... In one sense, oh, I'm scared. In another sense, it doesn't even matter. I need to come before God and admit it, and then, then he's going to show me his love. Even in my sin, he's going to say, no, but I care for you. You're mine. That's amazing, right? Now, Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6, is, is, a, is a passage that we typically use at funerals, which is quite strange because it's a really a passage for the living, right? I mean, right? And so when we read it, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I, I don't have any needs at all, right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But they're also a correction. Right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love that passage. I memorized it a long time ago. I still just like to think about it. It brings me great joy. It, it, it calms my soul. It reminds me that, that no matter what happens, God will be with me, right? I mean, even though I walk through the darkest valley, no matter what kind of horrible hell comes my way, God isn't walking away from me. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's, that's good, isn't it? I mean, that just, that's, that's good. That's saying, it doesn't matter how awful I am or how awful I think I am. God isn't turning his back on me. He wants me to do well, to live well. So, here's the issue, though. I'm going to talk about three ways we typically read our Bibles as reference material. And some of these ways are the ways we have just locked our brain in. But I, I want you to, at the end of this, think about it not as reference material. So let's just put that up front. So the first one is a theological dictionary. Some people turn to the Bible when they have a question about a thing, like Wikipedia. You know, what is this and how do I use it? <laughs> right? Like, I need to understand life, so I'm going to just, you know, find one of those handy dandy references, and it's going to point me to this scripture, and it's going to make it clear that this is how life works. Here's the definition. Here's the way it works. This is done. Explained it all, I'm good, and move on, right? Does it work like that to a degree? Yeah, you can use that to a degree. It's, it's, um, in the fancy technical jargon, this is called systematic theology, right? Where you sit down with the, the, the ideas of the Bible, and you pull out of them um, the, the principles of life, and you try to make sense of them for your day, your time. And in fact, there's an entire, um, I mean, gobs of books have been written on this, and everybody does it, and we do it, and you do it, and I do it, and everybody does it, and it's just, it's normal to do this, because we want to understand a thing, it's one of the ways to do it, so, and number two, a law book, that this is how you have to live, this is how you have to eat, this is how you have to sleep, um, the clothing you should wear, uh, who you can love, who you, who you can't love, who you can pray for, who you can't pray for. I mean, the laws, if you're really serious about it, get really deep. 
and they go, you can extrapolate. This is the extension of the theological dictionary because when you get to the law book mentality, it's like here's the definition and here's how we parse that out. Here's how we make sense of that and here's the steps you have to take to get there and you better agree with me because if you don't, well then you're going to hell. I'm not because I'm right and you're wrong, right? And that, that's not healthy, is it? I mean, we all do it to a degree. We, we want to know what's right. We're searching for how to live and we say, give me the law. Show me the law. And in fact, the, the scriptures themselves say, this law book you've given us, God, I mean like the Psalms talk about it a lot. I meditate on your law day and night, right? Because by it I live. I meditate on it. It's like honey from a honeycomb. Oh, it's so good. I love it. Mm, 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 right? And we, we want to know how to live. And anytime there's a moral argument in the world, anytime somebody does something that offends us, we pull out the scriptures and we say, hey, 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 you can't do that, buddy. And typically this is the way the world looks at the scriptures. Like, this is it. You've got to do it this way. And, but it, it, it's not really life-giving. In, in some sense, it robs us of life if that's the predominant way we look at life in and, and the Bible. Now, the third one is like the higher, more elevated devotional material. Um, like, I'm going to read the Bible every day. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to pray a little bit. I'm going to take out my journal. And I'm going to write down some scripture. And I'm going to uh, pull out the principle for me today. And I'm going to make sense of it in 20 minutes or less, right? Anybody do that? Some people do that like every day. And this is, this is good. All these things are good, they're not evil, but if they are the only way we see the Bible, then it's lacking, it's missing. It's just, it doesn't have real life. Because in the devotional material idea, the number one thing is that I get an aha. That I go, oh, that's good, I learned something. I've been stuck in this one for the longest time. The, the earlier ones were my growing up, and the last one, that's been a long time, like just, ah, I got something new. I want something, ah, come on, God, give me something. I want some. I want to feel good about you and about me and about the world, and I want to, ah, this, this is great. It's not wrong to use the Bible in these three ways, but to only use them as that can be a little disconcerting and unhealthy. For instance, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Anybody know this verse? Everybody should know this verse. It's on all the coffee cups. People put it on their house and stuff, and, you know, people stitch and cross-stitch and needlework and all kinds of other things, and, you know, even people have it on T-shirts, and it's like the theme for their life, for their year, for their everything. If you don't know it, you'll know as soon as I flip the... Yeah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. That's a beautiful verse, isn't it? That's a great verse. Who was it written to? It was written to some Jews a few thousand years back, and where were they? They were in Babylon, right? They were in exile. Why were they there? Because they disobeyed God. Well, what, did God tell them that was going to happen? Yeah, was this the will of God that they would be in exile? Well, not exactly, but yeah, kind of, because he, he knew it was coming. Oh, this is getting messy. I don't like this. Can we just stick to the verse because it feels good? No, we have to put context around it and understand it for where it is, right? They're still in exile. And he says, look, I don't want you to live in exile. I don't want you to live away from the promised land. I want you to be back there. This is my hope for you is that you would live there. But at the same time, they're not living there. <laughs> and to get them back, there's a whole lot of mess and a lot of work. And even when they get back there, they're not fixed. They're not right. They don't live right. They don't live up to this. They just keep messing it up. So yeah, it's a great verse. It feels good. But if you actually read it in context, it's like, I don't want to be in exile. <laughs> I don't want to be in Babylon. I, don't, I, I actually want to live well. <laughs> I, want, I want to live like this, not like they were living when they heard this and not like they've been living since. Here's the other. This verse is actually pretty fitting. Do you know why? Because in a sense, we're still in exile. <gasps> no, we're not. Yes, we are. Why are we still in exile? We're still in exile because we aren't with God yet fully. Our Babylon is here and now, where we live, wherever that is. 
because the real promised land is heaven. And we're struggling to get there. And we beat ourselves up because we feel like we're living in exile, because we are. <laughs> and that's the way the scriptures kind of bend back on themselves again and again and challenge us to say, you know what, God, I want to live this way, but I'm not. So if we understand it in context, it's not bad, right? <laughs> if we put it all together and we go, yeah. And you might argue and say, well, Andrew, you kind of ruined that scripture for me, and I don't, I'm going to have to go home and throw out my coffee. No, you don't. <laughs> you can keep your coffee cup. Just remember that you're in exile. Remember that you're not home yet. That you're not in the promised land. That this life is full of trouble. That, that you know, one of the reasons I put up Psalm 26 is because Life isn't easy. You will walk through the valley of shadow of death more than once in your lifetime, multiple times, and it will hurt. And God says, I'm there with you. I, I know that pain. And you say, how does he know that pain? Because he was on the cross, right? So as you think about new year, new you, I want you to also think about the pain that's going to come. You know, there's the Omicron variant, and then there's going to be another one after that, another one after that. And, and our paradigms have all shifted about how we do church because there's a whole bunch of people joining us online because they are not comfortable being here, right? And there was only two months where we didn't join together because, well, for safety's sake, right? And all of our world shifted in that moment, and we said, whoa. And many of us have said, now, I don't want to live that way. And in some sense, we're burying our head in the sand. And others have said, I don't want to live that way. And we're trying to do everything we can to keep ourselves healthy. And some of us have gone overboard over the top. And we're going the other direction saying, come on, God, this ain't right. I'm just going to lock myself down until it's all over. I'm going to hide in my room. And I'm going to stay home. And I'm not going to talk to anybody, see anybody. And I understand that too. Don't hear this as judgment. Hear this as, I've been through every one of those phases. I've felt all of them. None of them are easy places to live. And in a sense, they're all exile. And they're all crying out, God, I know you want me to do well. I know you want me to live well. But, you know, this verse is often pulled so far out of context. Name it and claim it. You've heard that, right? Just name your new reality. Speak your existence as you would like it. I want to be wealthy, and you will be. God will bless you. Put your hand on the TV, put your hand on the radio, whatever, right? Send me a dollar, and I'll send you back ten. What? It gets pulled so far out of shape that it is disastrous, and it, it hurts people. It destroys their lives when we take Scripture so far out of context that they're just painful. And you say, but that's not us, that's not our church. But we do it to a degree, don't we? Because every time we have bad theology, every time we have bad ways of reading Scripture, it hurts people unnecessarily. Scripture's going to hurt them enough. We don't have to target them, right? And so as we think about Scripture, we want to put it in its context, see how it works, see how it operates. And what's the purpose of Scripture anyways? Why is it there? Why do we have the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament? What is this all about? What's the point of it? What's the point of this sermon, you might be asking? Well, we're going to get to that in just a minute. <laughs> Faith challenges. Wrapping up. And the first one is what I believe is one of the best understandings of the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is a unified story that leads us to Jesus. The whole Bible. The whole Bible brings us to Christ. And when we understand the whole Bible in its context, in its time, when it was written for those people, how it was written for those people, then we can bring it forward into our time and make it help it. How do we say this? It can make better sense. It makes more sense to us today, and it's not painfully twisted up and backwards and different and weird because we're trying to stretch it to say things that it never said, right? Number two, Jesus leads us to love. So the first one is that the Bible is this whole thing just focusing us in on Jesus' life, on him, on living like Christ, doing everything we can to be like him. And when we do that, we know that his life leads us to love. And he upends a whole lot of things 
you know, those paradigm shifts. But most of those you've already been shifted, were already shifted before you came along. So, I mean, you think about, think about for a minute the, the Ten Commandments. Think about the Ten Commandments in a way that maybe you haven't before. You think about Paul. How, first off, how the earliest Christian, not Christians, I'm sorry, the Jews would have read the Ten Commandments. And then you think about how Jesus read them, and then you think about how Paul read them. So, so think about the Sabbath, okay? This is a really good example of this. The Sabbath, you keep the Sabbath. If you don't keep the Sabbath, what happens? Do you remember? You, you get stoned, right? Not recreational, not just token a little marijuana. It, you, the stone's thrown at you and you're killed and then you, you're lit on fire and all your stuff too, right? I mean, that was the command from the scriptures. If you don't keep the Sabbath, this is what happens. That's awful, right? Yeah, really bad. Now, Jesus comes along and what does he do? He says, that law was written that you might have life, but you're misapplying it. Here's this woman who's been caught in sin and in pain, and she's been unhealthy for how long in her life? And, and you're telling me I can't heal this one? Well, what about that one with the, with the hand? His hand's all jacked up. What about that, what about that one who's a prostitute? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heal that one too. What about the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one? And, the next one? and Jesus goes around healing everybody on the Sabbath, and the, and the Jews say, you can't do that. Stop it. You people quit coming to him on the Sabbath. Jesus says, that wasn't the meaning of the Sabbath. It was to give life. And even still, if your donkey falls in a ditch, you're allowed to get it up out. So why not release all these people from their sin? And then Paul comes along later and says, guess what? The, the, the Sabbath, some of you are going to keep it and some of you aren't. And most of us have said, we're not. <laughs> and he says, you're doing that out of the glory to God. You want to live in a way that honors God. And, and Paul says, that's okay. Because you're Gentiles. You don't understand the Sabbath. But if you understood it, I think you'd want to keep it as best you could. Because it's life-giving. But we don't traditionally follow the Sabbath. I mean, historically, there were some laws that we put in place in America, and nobody could do anything on Sunday, but that's not the Sabbath. The Sabbath's Saturday. Right? And so, 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 so now today, we're all twisted up about it, and, and in fact, we've gone the whole other direction, and some of us have said, how dare you, don't be trying to keep, put that on me, because I don't have to keep the Sabbath, because that, that's the Old Testament, it's gone. But I think Timothy and Paul would have read that very differently. I think they would have understood that in a way that was life-giving, and they would have said, it's a blessing to keep the Sabbath. Consider keeping it. Now, we could do that with a whole host of other things, but I, I, this is just one thing that we could do that with. And I want you to consider that really love transforms everything. It shifts all of our understandings incredibly because we're more generous, more kind, more thoughtful, more aware of others, right? So you're wondering, number three is spending time with God as friend. I think this is the purpose of the Bible. It helps us to recognize who Jesus is it helps us to recognize how to love. And when we read scripture, it's not to look at it as a theological dictionary, a law book, or devotional material. And this is the hardest one for me. And it's only recently that I've really realized this. That when I open my Bible, God isn't saying to me, you better get something out of this. <laughs> He's saying to me, you're spending time with me. You're just spending time with me. And when you spend time with a friend, I mean, think about it. Do you journal all of the time you spend with your friend? <laughs> do you, like, do you have to do that? Like if, let's just call Doug my friend. He's my only friend in, in the whole world. And he apologizes, and rightly so. <laughs> but let's say me and Doug are friends, and every time I hang out with Doug, it's for 15 to 20 minutes, it's just once a day, and I, I have to write down everything that I get from Doug, and I'm, you know. Or everything Doug says is law to me, and I have to do it. Or, or you know what, in reality, I don't really spend that much time with Doug. 
Instead, it's maybe once a week, and if I wake up on time. <laughs> and, well, no, 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 but I'm really serious about it, and I'm there every Sunday, and it's, I've got to spend my time with Doug. And I think about it for as long as I can hold it in my head. But then I just let it go. So, but but if, it's, if, it's, if, if Doug's your friend, it's not like that, is it? It's, it's not regimented. It's not ritualistic. There's times and there's opportunities that I, I like hanging out with Doug. Doug's a great guy. He should not apologize. He's, an, he's a joy to be around. He's funny. But I've only journaled once or twice after spending time with him. <laughs> and it was because I said, hey, I want to get to know you. And in getting to know him, I wanted to write down his life story so I could keep it straight in my head. And that's because I'm the preacher. If I wasn't the preacher, I probably wouldn't have journaled that. I would have just sat and talked with him and remembered his life as best I could. But because there's so many of you, and I'm trying to remember all of your lives, I've got to write it down. But I say that to you to say it's not wrong to use the Bible as a devotional book. But really, you're spending time with a friend. And God doesn't look at you and say, wasn't 20 minutes today. <laughs> God doesn't look at you and say, well, you didn't get anything out of it. You didn't understand it. You went away confused. That's bad. Sit there until you figure it out, buster. God doesn't say that. God says, thanks for coming. And sometimes I would bet God would prefer you not even open the Bible. And that sounds really bad, right? But I'm betting sometimes God would like you to just sit with him and say, God, I'm here with you. I'm here to hang out. I, I think that's okay. And some people say, well, you're taking it too far. What if we're walking in the woods and, you know, and we call that church? That's not the same thing. That might be a version of church for you. But generally, church is the gathered people of God together, understanding, growing, learning, and, and doing everything they can to recognize their friend, their savior, their creator. I mean, it's, it's a bit more complex, right? But God doesn't mind at all if you go for a walk through the woods with him. That's spending time with your friend, right? So spend some time with your friend. Recognize what love is. And see again that the whole of Scripture points us to Christ. And that when we understand it in its context, it is life-giving. And it gives us a new way to live and think and behave because we're not wrapped up in keeping all these commands. We're not wrapped up in fixing everybody around us. We're not wrapped up in all kinds of things that might be destructive instead of life-giving. Instead, we're wrapped up in love. And we're wrapped up in God. And he says to us, I, I do have plans for you. I, I love you. And I want what is good for you. And so we're going to pray in a new and slightly different way for some of us. From Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 8. So if you would, just read with us on the next scripture. Father... Your word has said something like, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. They do not fear when heat comes. Their leaves are always green. They have no worries in a year of drought, and they never fail to bear fruit. We want to trust you like this, God. As we continue to pray, Father, we ask that you would help us to turn our lives back to you again and again, that we might know and experience your presence. God, that we might be with you as a friend, one who walks and talks just like Moses and Adam and Eve and Jesus and the apostles as they knew Jesus. God, we long to be in your presence in a real way. God, we want to feel and know your love for us and for the people around us. God, let us turn to you again and again in this year as we think about what is to come and the pain that we've suffered and the hopes that we have. God, let us turn to you as a friend and enjoy you as we open our Bibles and we read. I do pray that we will do that regularly, that we'll, we'll see you with us and that we'll put the things into context in the proper place in the proper way and, and see you better. That we might see ourselves and see the people around us as your image bearers, as people that you made, God, who are in your image and who love you, even if they don't know it. 
And God, help us to love them. Help us to love ourselves. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.